a pretty significant uh, oh, uh, color shift. A uh, popular way to uh, a popular way to address the noise is to take multiple short exposures, and then align them, and then do some kind of Fourier domain merging. And so, academic algorithms like VBM4D do pretty well. And indeed, at Google, uh, we've shipped HDR Plus, a system that combines learning-based auto exposure uh, with bursty noising on Nexus and Pixel phones for a number of years now. Uh, however, bursty noising does have some limits on how dark of an environment it can uh, ultimately handle, as well as how much motion it can actually tolerate. So, I'd, so I'd like to think of bursty noising as a computational version of long exposure. And it's, it's a way of computationally coping with some amount of motion. But to avoid blur in the dark, like the, you simply need more light. And this brings us to the topic of my talk, which is flash. So here's the same 20 lux uh, office scene. And he, um, if we had used a standard uh, LED flash that's found on your phone, you'll get something like this. And as you can see, it flash adds a lot of light, and we get a somewhat usable picture. But it comes with a number of downsides, um, the biggest being that it actually dazzles the subject. So this is especially bad for people whose eyes are dark adapted, and in a lot of situations, this is unacceptable. Uh, another issue is that the appearance is harsh and unnatural. Uh, the right photo is clearly taken with a flash and doesn't reflect the ambient lighting, which is actually this sickly green color. And finally, uh, flash has a limited number, uh, has, a, has only limited power, and only eliminates nearby subjects. Uh, in this talk, we'll only focus on the first two. So to avoid dazzling the subject, we can use a uh, infrared or uh, ultraviolet flash that's outside of the visible spectrum. So this idea was first pioneered by Christian and Fergus, and they took two pictures. Uh, first, they take a IR UV flash photo, and so this raw image is rendered in green since it's not white balanced. And then immediately after, they take another standard photo with the flash off. So then they use a sophisticated optimization to merge the two, and then this produces a natural looking result, one that looks pretty close to the long exposure ground truth. Um, so there are some downsides though. Like just as with uh, burst fusion, it doesn't work if there's significant motion between the two frames, except now it's actually much harder because the two images have been captured at different wavelengths. Um, a subtle but more important point is that um, since both photos were captured using the same sensor, uh, they had to remove the optical filters of the standard camera to make it sensitive to IR and UV. So unfortunately, it also means that the flash off photo is now contaminated by an ambient IR and UV light. And this shows up as a red, a red tint and a slightly blurrier image. So this brings us to our solution, which is to simply use two cameras in a stereo configuration. So in our design, we use two geometrically identical camera modules, meaning they have the same sensor size, resolution, and lenses. But for the left camera, and we just use this wh whatever's on your phone. It's uh, just a standard RGB Bayer mosaic. But for the right camera, we change this Bayer mode pattern to be sensitive to near IR and UV. So in this idealized setup, we can also use flashes that uh, whose spectrum matches that of the sensor exactly. So now let's take a look at how this acquisition works. So recall that the left camera is just a regular RGB camera. So therefore, it can't sense the flash at all. The right camera's red and blue channels have been replaced by IR and UV. However, uh, the green channels are exactly the same as that of the left camera. So whenever we take a photo, we will always fire this invisible flash because why not? We can't see it. Um, and if we synchronize the two cameras and then use the same exposure time, then motion will be less of a problem because they have the exact same amount of blur. And more importantly, the green channels have the, uh, have the exact same central special spectral response, which means we can actually just use standard visible light stereo on it. And once we have correspondences, uh, we can warp and merge any number of and merge them using any number of algorithms to produce not only a good quality RGB image but also depth. So this design is also nice in, in that uh, if our merging algorithm ever fails, uh, for example, if it's due to there's too much motion, there's too much noise because it's really dark we can always fall back to a monocular RGB image since we didn't do anything to the left camera. Okay, so that's the ideal design uh, and capture setup. Uh, 
building an actual hardware prototype, uh, we ran into some interesting uh, actual issues. So the biggest being that there is no such thing as a pair of cameras that differ only by their spectral sensitivities, but are otherwise identical. So, so what we actually did was modify a pair of point, point gray cameras. So first we found a pair of lenses that, uh, that could focus at near IR and near UV wavelengths and didn't have too much chromatic aberration. And then we sourced some LEDs that, uh, that whose spectra matched th that of the, the lenses. Uh, we then measured this, this, our sensor spectral sensitivities and found that the blue and green channels was at, were actually slightly sensitive to UV. So for the RGB camera A, we added a UV filter. For the hyperspectral camera B, we removed the IR cut filter. Uh, this makes it sensitive to uh, both IR and UV, as you can see from the curve. But of course, now we have the same problem as the original dark flash paper in that all three channels are now sensitive to some parts of near IR. So uh, for us, we deal with this by controlling the illumination. So we capture mostly indoor images so that there isn't much ambient IR. And our IR flash is at wavelengths where the blue and green channels aren't very sensitive. So this is OK for a proof of concept. But for a real product, we will actually need to man manufacture a new color filter array. And that's pretty expensive. So let's look at the capture sequence in more detail now. So as you know, it's pretty annoying to capture a lot of data using a prototype camera where we walk around with a laptop. So we captured a bunch of bursts uh, and inst uh, to try to cover our bases. So the first thing we did was capture images with the white LED flash, so for just, just for comparison. And we also then captured two dark flash bursts because we weren't sure how much ambient IR actually affected our scenes or any of our algorithms. So, there's, so we actually tried two different strategies. In the first burst, we synchronized the two cameras to take identical exposures. And on odd number of frames, we capture a stereo pair with the flash off. And then on even number of frames, we fire the dark flash for various durations. Uh, if there's no scene motion or IR contamina contamination, this is a pretty close approximation to the, the, uh, the design that we want. And for the second burst, uh, we matched the hyperspectral camera's exposure with that of the flash. The idea there being that uh, if we can minimize the amount of IR contamination that's actually captured, um, but uh, of course, this comes at the cost of having slightly different motion blur between the two cameras. So after looking at our data, it turns out that the ambient IR didn't make a huge difference. So we ended up just using the first burst. But we will make all the data available. And so after the second burst, we capture another white flash image just to make it closer in time in case there's any small amount of motion. And finally, we capture a long exposure frame with the flash off so that we can have ground truth. So in total, we captured about 250 scenes. Uh, they're mostly of people who are asked to uh, hold still, as well as a bunch of static objects. We also captured each scene at four different exposure times to vary the noise level, and we did it for IR and IR plus UV. So this is actually a fairly large data set. Um, so now let's look at looks in images. So the first pair shows the difference uh, between uh, the left and right when the IR flash is on, ex exposed to the same level. So um, yeah, so we have this identical shutter time and gain, and neither is white balanced, so that the left image has a green tint, and but notice how much brighter and redder the right image is. So if we, now, if we add the UV flash, we add a bit more signal into the blue into the the short wavelength channel of the right image, and you, can, you may notice that that the toy in front is overexposed, and the left image is not actually unchanged, right? So that's a lie. Uh, this is the actual left image. So even though the uh, RGB sensor is insensitive to RGB, many materials, as the previous talk said, fluoresce under UV light. And they glow with this very sickly, unpleasant blue light that we don't really want. So this actually turned out to be quite a problem because you have this spatially varying uh, blue signal. So we ended up using IR only for all results. But you know, uh, again, the data will be available if you want to try to deal with this problem. So here's another scene with a human subject. Note that, note that there's a specular highlight on her glasses, which was caused by the flash. So it'd be an interesting thing to try to remove. And this is a scene with motion. So notice how the motion blur is identical between the two views, because they have the identical exposure time. So now let's look at how we can try to fuse these images. So the input to our algorithm is a pair. So the left image is RGB and is dark and noisy. And the right image is brightly lit by the flash. And so from the two green channels, we can compute uh, depth using the bilateral flow algorithm. 
And once we have depth, we can reproject the, the left image onto the right coordinate frame. So hopefully you can see a little bit of the, see the disparity on the on the top right there. And then we used a state-of-the-art algorithm called scale map to fuse the color of the RGB and uh, the, between the two images. Now that we have one-to-one -one correspondence, and this produces a uh, image with low noise and sharp edges. Um, the scale map is pretty close to state-of-the-art for flash no flash fusion, and it's based on op optimization. So it's really good at reducing noise, and even fixes it can fix a bunch of shadow artifacts. However, the result is incorrect in color and tone. So to address that, we trained a deep neural network to simultaneously do type to, uh, to do color correction and tone mapping, and the result looks pretty close to the ground truth. So since our method is built using existing algorithms, I won't go into the details, but do want to highlight two components, which is how we compute stereo and how we do the color correction. So since stereo uh, registration is symmetric, we can run it in either direction. And the natural intuition would be to keep the RGB image stationary and then try to denoise it. But that doesn't actually work because the flash image is the one with the better SNR and the sharp edges. And so the, and the RGB image is the one that contains the correct color tone, which is of a, low, of a lower frequency, and the human visual system is more tolerant of errors in color than edges, sorry. So we decided to use the bilateral flow algorithm because it's edge aware. So the optimization gets a data term from these quite dark green channels. So that's a standard stereo data term. But we push the solution to be piecewise smooth. So it has the, the solution will uh, has to respect the edges in the, in the high SNR flash image. And as you can see, the depth solution here has a very sharp edges, even though the data term is very weak. So using this edge aware depth, we can sample from the left image and warp it. So, so after warping, we have a corresponding uh, flash image, no flash image pair from the viewpoint of the right camera. And in our data set, we also have a long exposure ground truth. So if we call these uh, samples xi and yi, we can simply fit a CNN that turns x's into y's. Easy, right? Just do argmin and then you're done. No, it didn't quite, we didn't quite exactly do this because as Vladvin talked about earlier, this works in general but requires a sufficiently large and diverse data set. We only had 250 different scenes and you know, it's large but it's sampled over a bunch of different uh, exposures, not, it's not sufficiently diverse to really cover, recover this. You think of this as a matrix inversion problem you have about 250 scenes, but you the number of parameters to do is actually something like Valen's network is you need to try to fit 50,000 parameters to only 250 numbers. So that's you know underdetermined. So the, so in, uh, in other words, asking the, the CNN to simultaneously denoise, remove shadows, cope with stereo errors, and correct for color is a bit too much with a limited amount of data. So instead, we first feed it through uh, the scale map algorithm, which gets us most of the way there, but as you can see, has the wrong color and tone mapping. And we, then we just train a CNN to do this last step. So for this, we modify HDRNet by uh, Garby et al. in 2017. So the interesting part of this network architecture is that it learns a transformation that is guaranteed to be edge aware. So, and we, mo so we modified it to handle nine channels of slightly misaligned data, and then you just train it to, to produce a transformation that, uh, an edge aware color correction transformation. Okay, let's just look at some results. So on the left here is a the noisy RGB image gained up by 5x, and on the right is uh, the, an IR flash image. So they look pretty substantially different from the ground truth here. Um, so our denoised and tone map result is on the left, along with the, uh, the, the, the depth map in, in set. And so compared to ground truth, the rendition is reasonably similar, but is actually noticeably flatter. You can see that the flash lit the subject in a number of places where the ambient lighting didn't. And, and so here's what the state of the art looks like for single image denoising. Uh, so this is DM3D, and you can see some characteristic uh, blob artifacts. And upgrading to a, the substantially more expensive VBM4D on four images actually only marginally improved the result. And so here's a, uh, the, the result from 2017's uh, fully, conv fully convolutional image processing network that uh, Vladan alluded to earlier, trained on our data set. So in this case, just because of how, how little data we have, this, these dilated convolutions really shows up as some pretty serious artifacts. So I'm pretty sure we can eliminate them if we uh, fit it onto a bigger data set. So here's another result on uh, someone with, skin, with darker skin tone. So notice how the, the texture on his jacket has much lower contrast than IR. So since the model mostly transfers color um, 
from the RGB, this texture is also suppressed on your inner output while the color is correct. And finally, one more result on a still life. So the result looks pretty good, but the apples look quite a bit off because it's missing this, these distinctive highlights that make them look like apples. So no deep learning paper is complete without a table showing how we outperform all our previous methods. So a few interesting things to note. Uh, so the learning-based methods actually always outperform the traditional ones based on, uh, at least measured in terms of PSNR. So this tells us the value of having at the ground truth available to at least fine tune whatever result you've had before. But we also notice that PSNR and SSMIM are actually very bad metrics for this task because if you look at, this, uh, if you look at our method compared with using the fully uh, convolutional image processing network, the images are actually pretty blurry even though they win on this score. So what seems to be best correlated with what we think is the best are the best looking results and is, is the, what's known as the style loss based on the grand matrix of uh, the VGG16 network. And of course, our full method performs the best there. So, uh, so I'm out of time, but yeah, so I didn't have time to cover a number of topics such as how we did auto exposure and how to design new Bayer patterns. And uh, yeah, there's a, uh, so th there's, and there's plenty of future work to do, including tackling local contrast and how to deal with shadows and finally, the, more, the most interesting part is how do you optimally capture these uh, 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 the best low, li low light and depth image given a certain energy and time budget because both compute and flash takes energy. Thank you. So, so I have a question, Kevin. You know that when you, you, know, when you photograph somebody's face, somebody's skin under UV, you can see all the Defectors. extra blemishes and extra you know, skin damage from the sun. And you are using, you know, a UV uh, LED in your in your system. So, did you see any effects? So then, when someone takes a selfie, it actually makes him appear a bit worse than what it would be just with RGB. Yeah, so you definitely you definitely see it. Uh, so and d so the scale map lets you like change. You can you can tune the uh, basically the contributions of what you want. So the ground truth does not have this. So then we will tr we will the network will tr try pretty hard to try to get rid of it. Right. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so we tried pretty hard to make sure that the at least the edges are well aligned. But there are definitely places where it performs poorly. And uh, so, scale map deals with it reasonably well. But uh, the HDRnet network that we use actually cannot hand fundamentally handle very large shifts beyond this, the spacing in bilateral space. So, and the outputs it produces are actually affine transforms, so it can only color correct. So whatever stereo artifacts you have will be present in the final result. More questions? Did you try on videos, the motion? Uh, we, we, we did not. <laughs> uh, I mean, the closest thing we have is VBM4D, but you can try, uh, we have basically uh, like off on off on eight frame bursts. <laughs> like we didn't have enough bandwidth to store a video, basically. So you had you had problems with the UV because of the fluorescence. Um, th so the next step would then be to do a third camera and just sort of to filter out the fluorescent effect. Or what wh what do you think? How you would tackle having the UV and the the IR flash both at the same time? Right, so I guess the problem, I, I, I actually don't know. So the problem is that when you emit UV, you, what you get back is blue, and so it just it doesn't, it, the scene is not really representative. So I think probably the most promising would be to capture a burst and then the trainer network or handcraft features to automatically know how to fuse all of this. All right, let's thank the speaker again.